over the world, but are set in Ireland, often in the kind of small community you knew as a child growing up in Dorky County, Dublin, in the 1940s and 50s. You still write for the Irish Times, the paper that gave you your first break as a journalist, and you still live in Dorky. Success hasn't changed you. But from your first novel, Light a Penny Candle, to the most recent, Tara Road, you've been a chronicler of change, not just in the lives of your characters, but in Ireland itself. Tara Road is about a divorce. Did you decide that fate for your main characters, or did they develop a life of their own? I didn't know there was going to be a divorce, but I knew there was going to be an, a separation or the end of love. Because what often interests me is how people can very often feel quite secure in a relationship where one person is totally happy and thinks it's bowling along great and that everything's exactly the same as the day they got married, the day they got engaged, whatever it was. And the other person is totally bored and is willing, wanting to get out. So when you set out on a novel, you don't necessarily then know how it's going to turn out for some of the people you've created. <clears throat> I don't know how it's going to turn out sometimes for people because I often think, uh, when I used to interview people for the Irish Times 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would be there sitting with my notebook and sometimes authors would say to me, maybe American authors would say, I love my characters and my characters have a life of their own. And I would immediately say, will somebody pass me the sick bag? Nobody <laughs> could possibly think their characters have a life of their own. But sadly, either I have become affected and idiotic like that, or maybe that is the truth. And once I do start writing about people, I do begin to care about them. But I'm overkind to the characters. That, uh, and I don't see in most people, I don't see anybody who's an out and out bad, bad person. I think it's just as well I didn't meet Hitler. I might have found something <laughs> redeeming in him. And uh, I don't ever think that every good person is, is absolutely totally good either. I think most good people I know, um, certainly myself included, have a few irritating habits and I think you can really only love and appreciate your friends once you, you have accepted their irritations. So I tried that in terms of characters. But you have an overwhelmingly positive view of life, it seems to me, Maeve. Where does that come from? I think a lot of it comes from a happy, happy childhood, a happy, secure childhood. We were, I was the eldest of four children in, uh, I grew up in Dorky. And our parents thought that we were absolutely wonderful. I thought I was brilliant. I thought I was a great girl. I was told I was a great girl. In fact, I was told I was the best girl in the world. I was a bit irritated when my sister Joan came along then. I had to share being the best girl in the world. And when, and when Rini came along and my brother Billy. But that was all right. I was old enough by the time Billy came along to accept that, uh, that, uh, you know, that there, there were other, other great people. We were, we were all given a great confident uh, upbringing in a sense. We, we, th we were told we looked lovely and we were told we were brilliant. And uh, if I had children, that's what I'd have done for them too. Because it's, it's better than looks or money or uh, connections or anything to give a child a sense of confidence. Maybe we were overbearing and, and appalling. I don't think we were because uh, I just don't think that was the, the way it was in the home. And that gave me a bit of confidence and that's why I'm fairly positive about things. Mm -hmm. But confidence is also a great theme in your novels. There's very often a character who learns self-confidence or who is taught self-confidence, often by a teacher like Angela in, in, in Echoes and so on. Now, are you consciously reflecting that aspect of your childhood there? I suppose so, because uh, my mother believed everyone could do everything. You know, she, was, she absolutely believed everything. Uh, there was no question that you, you couldn't do everything. And so I sort of think that too myself. I and mean, I learned very late in life, I learned uh, to drive when I was 49 and I went out and I had 30 driving lessons and I got my driving test first go. When I was 50 I learned to play bridge. Now you and I have had a hand of bridge <laughs> together in our time and I don't, I don't think even, even my dearest friend and greatest admirer would say I was a good bridge player but at least I learned to oh, play yeah, it. Yeah. I, I learned to play it and I think I, I always always believe that we can all do anything. I feel that if somebody sat down, if I'd known Einstein and if I'd been able to concentrate for half an hour I'd have understood relativity properly and been able to explain <laughs> it and this, this I always think this is great for characters in books because I don't write what they call makeover novels in America. In, I've seen too often stories uh, where the fat girl becomes thin and therefore happy or the single woman becomes married and therefore happy or the poor man becomes rich and therefore happy and I've known a lot of rich uh, thin married people who are not happy at all and that's not what makes you happy it's uh, uh, it's what makes you happy is I suppose being able to appreciate what you've got and to play the hand that you were dealt to use another yeah. card metaphor and I think I, I, because I was once a teacher I think once a teacher always a bossy boot and I'm inclined to reform my characters a bit by telling them come on put yourself together take control of your life how would you teach them too? Because, uh, and, and this, I did want to ask you about this, it's interesting that you refer back to your, your life as a teacher, because your books are also full of um, 
ideas for self-improvement, for making your life better, for be, becoming a, a happier and better person, not as you say in a makeover sense, but in a, in a sort of inner sense. Did you always have a great urge to teach and improve people? Well, it's, it's funny about the self-improvement. I have a shelf now, not a shelf, a wall of, of self-improvement books. You have no idea. I don't read any of them. Or I, do, I read them quickly. And I think if I buy another book, uh, that I, I'll, I'll be able to sort my own life out. I can, I can run anybody's life except my own. <laughs> I have all these books called Put More Time in Your Life and How to Thrive on Stress and Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. I, I know all these books. And what I actually need to do is just actually sit down at my desk and answer my post and get on with things. That's what I need to do. And, you know, eat less, drink less, sleep more. I mean, I know, uh, I know that that's what I'm meant to do, but, but I think by buying a book, I can do it. When you were um, a girl growing up in Dorky, did you have any idea that one day you would be rich and famous? No, I was, well, I always wanted to be famous a bit. I was what my father used to call a notice box. I was always looking for notice, looking for attention. And uh, when I was very young altogether, when, I'd be, when they'd be telling me uh, uh, stories and reading me stories and they'd start about Red Riding Hood or uh, Goldilocks, I would immediately say, where was I? Where was I? And I was always have to be beside the big bear or with Goldilocks's granny or whatever it would be. And uh, once I knew where I was in the scene, I was quite happy. So it was obviously self-centred and an <laughs> egomaniac from the earliest days. But a storyteller then, were you? Or, rambling or stories. Uh, there was also a question of, you know, that when I'd come home from school, I would have long rambling tales. And I think I was kind of gently advised not to tell such long rambling tales about beginning, middle or end. And I'm very glad, as it turned out, that I didn't take any of that advice that I went on <laughs> telling them. But I had no idea. No, I was going to be a judge. Everything was, you know, done in extremes. When I was very religious, I was going to be a saint, not just go to heaven, saint. Then when I was going to be a <laughs> lawyer, I was going to be a judge because my father would speak. My father was a barrister. And he would speak in such awe of judges. And then when I realised I wasn't going to be a lawyer, I, was, I became a teacher. I was going to run the first comprehensive school in Ireland. And then when I went into journalism, which was the most extraordinary thing, I got a job in the Irish Times at the age of 28, never having worked a day in a newspaper. I actually got the best job in journalism, which was woman editor of the Irish Times. And then when I started to write books, I said, I hope they'd be bestsellers. And so far, it's all, it's all done very well by thinking big. <laughs> At what point in your life did the script change, you see, if, you, if, you were, if it was mapped out and you thought you were going to be a judge and all the rest of it? Where was the turning point? When did you realise you would be a writer? I suppose, in a sense, uh, the turning point for me, um, in terms of, of my total self-confidence and cheerful attitude to life, was, uh, like everybody else, I was an angst-filled student, you know, and you thought, you know, that the, also uh, go, looking at, around us in uh, university of the 50s, uh, you were afraid, I, I was afraid, it was going to be a bit like a beauty contest, you know, where the race would go to the petite and the gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And I got sort of this terrific insight uh, in university, which I'd wish that other 18, 19 year olds would have, which was that nobody is watching me. Now, this is an odd thing to say on a television program, but I've always had that feeling that nobody's watching me. They're more interested in themselves. And once you have that, it's a huge liberation. So that stopped me being self-conscious and spending hours and hours of work wondering about things, you know, and how, what people would think of me in certain places. Because I know they're not really thinking about me at all, they're thinking about themselves. Now, I, I'd like to get on to the, the method uh, by which you write in, your, uh, in a moment. But first of all, I'd like to take you back to UCD uh, and those days when, as you say, you discovered uh, how not to be self-conscious. Uh, Circle of Friends uh, is very much set in those days, and I wondered if the character of Benny was... was semi-autobiographical. Well, indeed, because uh, Benny lived in the country in the, in the book where she lived in the worst place in the world. I, I, had, I imagine her living somewhere in Kildare or Meath, somewhere she had to come home every, every place night on the, on the bus, the six o'clock bus. Now, I didn't quite have to come home on the six o'clock bus, but I had to come home on the ten past eleven train, which I can assure you was just as bad. And my father would often come down to the station to meet me. So you, you lived at, at home all the time you were oh, at the We lived yeah. too near, you see, mm -hmm. to, to, for it to be possible for me to go and live in a hostel or a mm -hmm. flat or anything mm -hmm. like that. We only lived eleven miles away from Dublin which was the worst thing in the world and my father would come down and meet me at the train and he used to say to me isn't that great you're home and I didn't want to be home I wanted to be in a smoky flat with the possibility that somebody might nuzzle my neck and, and that you know and there'd be Dave Brubeck on the, on, the, on the place we'd be lurching around and songs were swinging lovers that's where I wanted to be I didn't want to be home walking up the road so was that restrictive mate? well it was really but they were so nice that I couldn't do a thing about it is Benny partly you? yes you? because I mean what I had her was a, 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 as a sort of very protected child who didn't want to insult or hurt her parents but who went uh, Want, suddenly discovered at, at UCD as I did that, that 
it wasn't a question of a beauty contest. The fellas were like girls, really. They were kind of normal and they had conversations. And it wasn't like as if you were to dance the whole time. I, I fell in love with a few wildly unsuitable mm -hmm. people, I must say, in my time, none of whom returned my affection at all. But I, I didn't fall in love with the college hero, and that story was not mine. I wasn't betrayed by a friend. But the, but the atmosphere of it was. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a story in Circle of Friends of it is Benny, isn't it, who goes to the dance, who's a wallflower, and comes back and lies to her parents because she doesn't want to hurt them. Was that, was that you as well? well of course. Course, yes, when I went to my first dance, nobody danced with me, and I, I'm often. Uh, I mean, you see, I shouldn't really be telling these stories. I should only be telling these stories if I had turned out to be some roaring, raging beauty, some, you know, some who's about two inches wide. But what happened to me at the first dance was uh, I borrowed my cousin's dress, or my cousin's evening dress, because no, we wouldn't have had a long dress in the house. It was sent up on the train from Charlotte. And my cousin was four or five inches smaller than me uh, everywhere. So we put a great big blue band down the front of the dress, was sewn into it. And I hadn't any nice jewellery. And uh, I wore my Child of Mary medal around the neck, which must have been really terrific. But I bought earrings. And I bought little Diamante earrings, which had, there was a bit of blue in them. There were one and three pins, I remember, in Woolworths. And they, and there was, the, and, and shining sort of diamondy things. And I practiced them on my ears for a bit before I'd go. But I, I got sores in my ears instead, because I, they, they were too tight. So then I put, I'd asked her plaster band-aids on my ears because they had these desperate sores. And then I painted the blue to, make, to go with the dress and the blue ran down my neck and God alone knows what I must have looked like. And I'm not surprised that nobody danced with me. I'm surprised that I wasn't asked to leave. <laughs> but my mother and father were so proud of me when I was leaving. And they said, you'll look lovely. I remember my mother saying, you'll take the sight out of their eyes. So when I came home, I said to them, I had had a great time. And everybody danced with me. And I was danced off my feet. And I could see them smiling at each other. You know, they got up in their dressing gowns to know how it all went. It was a dreadful lie, but I couldn't let them know that the eldest of their brood had been such a disaster. And that was the time of being very self-conscious. I remember sitting in my room crying all night because there was a, where we, we lived, you could see the lighthouse. I remember watching the lighthouse going round all night. And I thought, in every home, they're all, they've all woken their parents. They've told them that nobody danced with me, didn't she? And I suppose there's still, there's still young people who have that kind of anxiety and think that the world revolves around themselves, whereas in fact probably nobody except myself, and I'm just telling this silly story now because, I'm, because I can laugh over it, uh, but I mean, there's probably nobody noticed that except myself, but that I got two dances and those are in the Paul Jones, you know, where you're in a circle and you have to dance with the person who stops in front of you. And I put that kind of thing into Circle of Friends. And You'll be so surprised at the numbers of people who write from all over the world having had something similar happen to them. Yes. I think that's, that's what people like. Like I once wrote in the Irish Times that when I went to stay in a hotel first, I was 18, and I didn't know if you made the bed or not. Now that's really quite a huge social thing. So we, I'd never stayed in a hotel. And I was afraid if I didn't make the bed, that when I came back, the manager would be standing at the door and saying, you're a tramp and you're not fit to stay in this hotel. But if I did make the bed, they'd think I was an absolute buffoon who didn't know that you, that you were meant to leave the bed untidy. So I folded it carefully back as if I had just stepped out of it. I thought that would, would, would do. And I must have got 300 letters from people telling me that they didn't know in a hotel either. And it is wonderful when you can kind of admit that and come out about such embarrassments because they don't seem important anymore. And they also help other people. Because I, I remember Catherine Whitehorn once writing that she thought you knelt on the backwash in a hairdresser. <laughs> and indeed, how would you know? Catherine Whitehorn said, more marvelous things in the world. Do you remember that she also said that, 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 that uh, the definition of a slut was someone who had to go to the laundry basket to take out something to wear because it's cleaner than anything they had out of it. And I think we've all been there too. <laughs> but you're very organized, Mave. I can't imagine anything like that happening to you. You're one of the most organized people I've ever met. I'm organized now because I have a very busy life and I wouldn't be able to get to do the things that I, yeah. that I want to do unless I made all these plans. And I read, as I say, I read these time management books <laughs> and I learn something from every one of them. Like one of the things I learned from them is, do the, which is a very good one that I love to share with people, is do the thing you dread most first. Are you organised about your writing? I mean, how do you set about creating a novel, a character's plot and so on? I'm very organised about that too, again, because now, funny enough, you, even I've had 12 or uh, 14 you can't books, short stories, uh, books published, it doesn't make you any more confident about the next one. You know, you're just as, as you're, you're still going into those rough, uncharted waters each time. And, and you have to be, it takes me about eight months to write a book. And uh, uh, that's after I have written an outline and submitted but to the what's, publisher. But what's the first thing? What do you begin with, Maeve? Begin with a, a person or a plot or a story or something you've overheard or what? A feeling. I just begin with a feeling, an emotion. For example, in Light of a Penny Candle, the feeling was friendship. The emotion was a friendship between, uh, that survived everything, including two women falling in love with the same man. 
I, uh, in Echoes, I had it was an ambition to get somebody out of, of a small village by studying. Mm -hmm. In uh, F uh, Firefly Summer, it was returning to roots. Mm -hmm. In Silver Wedding, the emotion was hypocrisy. In uh, Copper Beach, it was about the uh, education, the values of mm -hmm. an education. And so you, you start with the emotion, mm -hmm. you, you do the outline, you have the story, and then how do you begin to develop that? Do you have to chart out uh, with diagrams or how do you keep track of it all? Well I usually try and write down 12 chapters and I say by the end of chapter one this must have happened. You know, by the end of chapter one Rhea must have got married. By the end of chapter two something else must have happened. By the end of chapter three otherwise because when I was writing one of the books I got to page 600 and nobody had reached the age of puberty which was a bit <laughs> unfortunate since all the things were meant to happen in the book which could really only have happened once mm -hmm. they had. It was a book about childhood. So do I you just give them birthdays and, and, and I do. I do. I give them a house. I draw a house. For Tower Road I drew all the houses on Tower Road. I drew St. Rita's where the old people's home was and I drew, drew where Rhea's mother was and I drew where Gertie's laundrette was and where Rosemary lived and where the restaurant was mm -hmm. and, I, and I gave them a birthday each time. But how much would you do in a day? So? Um, it's very hard to, to, to know, Roshi, and you, but uh, usually never less than about 15 or 20 pages mm -hmm. in a day. Mary Lavin, the writer, said once, that she, she told me this because I teach her children and she told me this marvellous um, uh, thing which I thought was such a good advice and it uh, stuck in my mind that she used to work in the National Library and she would run along the street in case she'd be one minute late and when it was opening at 10 o'clock she regarded it as a job and, and like if you were late for your job in the civil service or the bank you'd be sacked so she felt that she'd be sacked so I do that too I run around my getting up in the morning and you know uh, uh, having breakfast and talking to the cats and doing the most minimal, minimal, I'm talking about nine minutes of housework to make the place look reasonable. And then I run upstairs, because we, uh, we have an upstairs study, to be upstairs at my desk at seven o'clock in the morning. And I mean, a lot of people think this is probably driven and pathetic, and I work from seven until one. Yes. And that gives you a great, great, great run at it. And I've, again, I'm, 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 a, I'm a compendium of, of little bits of advice that I've read or somebody has given me, but somebody once said to me, a kind of a, a casual, laid-back um, publisher. I don't think you write any worse when you write quickly, he said. He didn't say I wrote better, but he said, I don't think you write any worse when you write quickly. I thought that's a great thing to do. If I don't write any worse when I write quickly, well, at least I'll have the book finished quicker. Yeah. And, you know, and our nerves will all be, be all right. So as I go at it now, I go at like a bullet at a gate. And I keep writing. I only read, uh, like, I read myself in from where I was. I didn't read the whole of yesterday's mm -hmm. work because it might depress me if it was bad. I ramble on a bit too much mm -hmm. and I'm not good at cutting so I suggest to other people that they cut it for me like mm -hmm. editors and agents and things and because the book is, is enormous by the time they get it and they're, they're really quite good at knowing when I've gone up a siding or up an alley <laughs> and that it's not going anywhere and it's, you know it's sometimes you hate some of your darlings going you know they're, they're little, little anecdotes yes. about people but I, they warn me which is a very and I'm, I suppose that the one thing I want to pat myself on the back about is I do listen to criticism uh, from professionals and they say that, that, that you know, if they were to publish my book the way it is, it would be like a Cecil B. DeMille movie with a cast of thousands and we wouldn't actually know who anybody was because I would have brought so many people in and I, every time I meet some character I want to tell you that that character's life story and that has to be a bit restrained and the words that, um, uh, that, that they use to me as advice is try and focus, focus where we're going and I have, I have the word focus written up on my, on my desk mm -hmm. and I look at it carefully like a mantra in the morning. Now we talked about confidence being a theme in your in, in your novels and about people learning to stand on their own two feet and so on but the other great themes that you write about are love, marriage, friendship. How important are, are these in your own life? Well they're hugely important. Uh, when I was young I, uh, I was very lucky I always had lovely friends, good friends and I still have the same friends as when I was young which is great. And I'd always, uh, I, I've, I've known to t talk or to gossip and to, uh, gossip is a funny word, I don't think it's gossip, I'm just interested in people's lives and I think they are in mine and I'm, and I'm very interested in them as I think a lot of women are. Men have a different kind of bonding which is often, uh, they have a sort of a ruminative pint together and they talk about sport and they talk about politics and they sort of know that they're friends. I don't understand that yes. because women are inclined to need to have to explain what did you feel then and how did you think and do you think he does like you and do you think his mother is going to be difficult and do you think you will live there or somewhere else. Women ask about that and then they ask about their children. I don't think it's trivia at all but I, 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 mean, I, I think it's interesting so obviously all these things are important to me and I, um, I as I say, friendship is, is very important. I have a lot of very good friends, which I'm delighted. I, I love is greatly important, and I, I found love when I was older rather than when I was younger. I'm delighted to say, and I'm very happily, I think I'm happily married, but having written, written a book about uh, a person who didn't know, uh, you know, <laughs> their marriage was over, I mean, I'd like to sort of go out of the studio and check before, before, before I say that in a confident and smug way. Uh, I, I, I am 
very, very happily married. I don't have children, we don't have children, and I'm very sad with that. At least I was very sad when I was younger, when it didn't look as if I was going to have any children. But I have also got over that, because again, when I think of how much else that uh, life dealt us, mm -hmm. and also the fact that we have very, very good friends and relations who share their children with us. And all these people are now becoming grandparents, so now we're, we're, we're kind of surrogate grandparents as well. Mm -hmm. Life has gone <laughs> so quickly. I can't imagine that when it comes to the millennium that I'd be 60, because I think that you know that I, I think I'm, I'm in my early 20s and I still think of one of my friends thinks that we say what do we do when we're grown up <laughs> but in fact you have a great recollection of those years it seems to me reading your books the years between about 19 and 23 or 24 you have almost total recall I do have recall about that because uh, I think we lived through very interesting times I think anybody who was born in 1940 uh, lived, saw the, most, the whole country change so much uh, in Ireland, a huge amount of change. I mean, when I tell youngsters, as, I, mean, I, I begin to think I'm like some wildly eccentric batty old granny in the corner, when I used to say things that we had modesty vests, you know, uh, that when, when you're getting your clothes made, you had a little thing put there in case yes. a, a, a line. A lily for your valley. Is that, oh, I didn't know it was called that. What a wonderful <laughs> phrase. That's a, that's a great northern <laughs> phrase now. I didn't know that. But, we, but our dressmaker, we call it a modesty vest because men being, of course, filled with ravening lust, if they could see anything like a cleavage, I mean, they'd go for you and it would be your <laughs> fault because you'd have led them on. So we used to have this modesty vest and I used to say to the dressmaker, could we, could I have the modesty vest I could put in with little fasteners, you know, and take that, I could wash the modesty vest. Oh, very good idea. They said, I'd fling the modesty <laughs> vest away. Now, and I would tell that to my nieces, my cousin's children. They would look at me in absolute amazement as if I was talking about the Roman Empire or the French Revolution. <laughs> and I suddenly realised, of course, we have lived through certain times. My books, when, uh, uh, the early ones when they filmed, are called costume drama. And I mean, that's my childhood and they're called my youth and they're calling it <laughs> costume drama. And everything has changed so much in Ireland. I mean, for example, uh, the notion that, that I would be at my age writing a book about a divorce or about a separation was just unheard of. In, you know, in the 50s or the 60s even, it would have been an unhappy marriage about which mm -hmm. some uh, uh, sort of typical Irish solution to an Irish problem would, would have, uh, have evolved. But uh, never at all uh, would there be the idea that a divorce would be on the statute books and that the mm -hmm. Irish people would go abroad and come back again confidently. Because I remember the American wakes. I remember people standing crying at railway stations when a son or a daughter was going to America or Australia. But I do remember that. This is not fantasy. I remember whole families red-eyed crying. It was as if the, they were, the person was gone, they were never going to come back. How big a difference has money made to your life? It's made it very comfortable. I don't have to think anymore now about uh, if I'm on the phone to somewhere. I, I, if I'm going to Australia, I'd love to give my sister a ring and have a long chat about everything. And uh, I don't have to think, well, I better ring now and end after three minutes. I can talk for long. I don't have to fly to Australia with my knees under my chin like I did before. I, I was like uh, uh, on bending a corkscrew getting out the other end. I can fly business class mm -hmm. or even first class. Uh, that is lovely. So those are the kind of things that matter. Uh, nothing has changed. We didn't change our, our house. We didn't live in a mm -hmm. bigger house. We got a smarter car, but uh, I want that starts immediately, you know, <laughs> like that. And uh, we didn't get, I, I never, was never very interested in clothes, so yeah. we didn't get uh, a lot of, of yeah. fashion gear or anything like that. And I wasn't very interested in jewellery. And we certainly weren't, weren't interested in yachts. And so therefore there was nothing like that uh, to be got. So, so all it meant is that we had, we had much more comfort. And we've got grand insurance policies in case we both dry up and don't write another word. We've got huge insurance policies for when we get really old. And that's, that's what it is. I mean, I'd like to have thought, of course, that I'd give it all away. I give some away, but not, not as much mm -hmm. as I should. I get, I'm, but it is wonderful to be able to uh, help mm -hmm. people or things or organisations. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the difference has made. Uh, does it make a difference that you earn more than your husband? No, it doesn't at all. And I'm sure that if you had Gordon in, in a darkened room and uh, with a, a light shining in his eyes, I feel absolutely sure that he'd say the same. Because I remember on the day that I heard that, that we were going to get money, I was sitting by myself in the house and the phone call came. Mm -hmm. And it said, you know, your first book is going to be sold for £52,000, which was unheard of, more than any author has ever got for a paperback for the book in those days. Like even Frederick Forsyth hadn't got that. So I was sitting on the, the stairs for an hour in, in our house in London thinking, it's not going to matter, is it, that it's me rather than Gordon? It's not going to matter. And he was in the door, and I told him all about it. And I, and I said, it doesn't matter, does it? And he said, for goodness sake, it's the company. It's our money. It's the company. <laughs> and it doesn't matter which of us actually wrote the piece. And once he said that, I knew it was going to be all right. Because I do know yeah. one or two women, especially in the writing game, 
who have told me that it's a bit difficult and that their husbands mm -hmm. have to be made it's managers. It's kind of thing you might be writing about. You see, I could envisage you writing about a situation where a wife was more successful or had more money or something, and that might create tension. Yes, I think it would. It would be. I think it's very much. Uh, 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 I sort of would be. It would be the, the, the material for for a story and for things. But again, you see, if you wrote about your own life, uh, you know, if I wrote about my own life just as it is, it would be a very dull story. Nice, happy childhood. Got the jobs I want. Didn't work very hard. Great the ex exams. Um, just when I was th thinking, you know, maybe I should tr just be a career woman and never marry. I met the nicest man in the world. Married him. Happily married for 20 years. And uh, I mean, that would be a very dull story. In fact, nobody would want to hear that. So I don't write much about my own life. I would, would definitely write about things that happen in other people's where there's more conflict and there's more right. tension. Now you always say the life dealt you a good hand, but isn't there anything you would change? If I had it all over again, uh, if I had it all over again, I suppose I, I would certainly have been nicer to my parents. I was quite nice to them, but I was restless. I was, I was quite nice. Did they live to see your success, maybe? Not really, no, no. And my mother certainly didn't. I was still a, a teacher and my mother um, was, 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 was dying. And, you know, she, she, she always was trying to tell me to be slightly less loud. You know, I mean, maybe I, if, if maybe it was a bit less loud, she might settle down and find some nice man to marry her. My father saw me working in the Irish Times, which was good. But, he did. but the real thing which is sad about their deaths, because they died um, such a long time ago, is they didn't see their four children happily married, you know, all very, very happily married, and living in Dorky, the place where we all grew up. Do you think there's any sense in which your parents actually are aware of your success? I mean, are you remotely religious or spiritual? I have to think that there must be. i tell you why. I, I, I wasn't too sure. I wasn't too sure for a long time. I thought that, you know, that it all ended in the sleep. You know, I didn't think there was a nice uh, ages of feathers and God and everything waiting for us there. But as I've got a bit, what I'd like to call sort of mature and mellow, and I think to myself that there has to be a purpose in things. You know, there has to be some kind of purpose. And people can't be just extinguished like that and disappear. And I remember the day my father died, uh, some nice colleague of his said to me, isn't it wonderful he's in heaven? And I said, oh, that doesn't help me very much now, that statement, you're very kind, but it doesn't help me. And this man said to me, ah, but you can't think of a spirit as marvelous as your father's could be just extinguished and blown out like a candle, can you? And that was helpful. And I don't think that they could be blown out like candles. There must be, there must be something. I'm not quite sure what form it is. It's not in the form that I thought about when I was young, but they're all sitting up there in a line waiting for us to join them. But then I always had a very extreme view of everything. <laughs> you write very kindly about priests and nuns, quite warmly about them. You're not anti-clerical. Oh, some no, no, but then, see, I had no reason to be. I, I was uh, taught by extraordinarily nice, educated nuns. Uh, Who are getting a bad press these days. Indeed. And and was, again, I was lucky in that one, you see. I mean, I, I, I met very, very nice uh, nuns. I, I, can't, I can't be anti-clerical or I can't be anti-nun because it didn't, it didn't occur in my life. My, uh, my mother's sister is a nun, and it's amazing now in the big convent. She's old now, but in the big convent where she uh, is still, um, there used to be about 120 or 130 nuns. There's only five nuns there left now. I often think about them and I wonder, do they think it was all a waste of time, really? Or do they think uh, that this was the way it was meant to be? They all seem quite calm and serene. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the, these bees are not vicious, bad people locking children up in, and having a poor, unfortunate, uh, unmarried mothers scrubbing floors. The ones I've come across are very decent. Maybe, maybe the sunglasses that I was given were very rose-tinted. <laughs> but it would be silly to pretend that it wouldn't. Uh -huh. But the people who've written, I mean, the people who have suffered, like, say, James Joyce or Brenda Bean or Edna O'Brien, I mean, I don't think they're making it up. They're, they're writing about what they knew, and, and that's what they write about what they know. I write about what I know. Maeve Binchy, thank you very much.